Truly stupid ideas can only be passed nationally in Washington. Good ideas can be passed state by state. Welcome to World of DAS, a show for data enthusiasts. I'm your host, Warren Hoffman, CEO of SafeGraph and GP of Flex Capital. For more conversations, videos, and transcripts, visit safegraph.com slash podcasts. Hello, fellow data nerds. My guest today is Grover Norquist. He is the founder of Americans for Tax Reform and the creator of the No New Taxes Pledge. Uh, he's probably the most influential conservative activist in the country. Grover, welcome to World of DAS. All right. Good to be with you. Thank you so, for the opportunity. Really excited. Now, um, the two parties have this kind of duopoly on power, and, and some believe that the duopoly is hurting the country. Would you agree with that? And if so, like, is there a way to make the power more diffuse? Okay. I would argue that having two parties is a good idea, not a bad idea. If you look at other countries where governing coalitions are, in fact, coalitions of groups that do not get along at all, or have three or four extreme positions on them. You know, the German government would like to govern and they've got somebody in there saying you can't have nuclear power. Okay. Um, and if you kick them out of your, <laughs> your coalition, you don't get to govern. Um, but if you had two parties, you could take a look at broadly where you want. Why does it make sense in the United States? I think it makes a lot more sense in the United States to have two parties than it ever did in the past. Uh, not too long ago, if somebody told you they were Republican, you knew, that, knew they were born north of the Mason-Dixon line. That's <laughs> all you knew about them, okay? Um, and you had all of these, you know, Democrats who were Democrats because Sherman had been irritating to Atlanta recently, um, which is not really a good reason to pick up teams uh, when you're trying to run the country that's the most important country in the world. And so during the lifetime of Ronald Reagan, you saw the two parties, which had been regional parties, and there'd be different immigrant groups would come in and whoever was mean to them, they joined the other team, the other party. Again, not a very rational way to do it. Uh, I was in Boston, the Irish came in, they became Democrats, the Italians came in, they became Republicans, really. Um, and so it didn't mean a lot. So you had liberal Republicans and conservative Republicans and liberal Democrats and conservative Democrats. So everything was bipartisan because nobody's jersey told you anything about what they did. It, yep. It's as if you went into a store and there were no labels on the products you were trying to buy and you, you wouldn't know what you were getting. I voted for Democrat. Is he going to raise your taxes or cut your taxes? Start a war or not start a war? I don't know. Who knows? Um, but the two coalitions now make a lot of sense to me. On the right, we have the Leave Us Alone Coalition, the Ronald Reagan Republican Coalition. Go around the table. Everybody's in the room because they want to be left alone on their vote moving issue. It, some people don't raise my taxes. Some people don't regulate my business. Some people leave me my religious liberty. I want to practice my faith and transmit it to their children. Back off, leave me alone. For some, it's the Second Amendment. I want to practice my Second Amendment uh, rights to, uh, to to own a gun. Yeah. I don't want to knock on other people's door and tell them to be hunters or gun owners. I just want to be left alone, me, to do what I want to do. And so around the table, you've got uh, uh, homeschoolers, private school people, uh, a whole series of groups of people who over time, vapors who don't want to be shut down by the government, around the table, new people come in whenever the government steps on somebody's toes and they say, I'm now political. You saw the now the parents movement that just figured out what was happening in public schools and that the par parents were being treated like dirt uh, and not listened to. And so now they're politically active and they want to be able to make decisions about their own children's uh, education. So there's a center-right coalition, a Leave Us Alone coalition, and the reason it holds together is that nobody wants anything at the expense of anyone else. I put together a meeting in D.C. every week, 100 plus people, and around the table, that's who it is. Everybody's there because on their vote-moving issue, they want to be left alone. Doesn't mean everyone in the room is a libertarian, but it does act in a libertarianish way because everybody's vote-moving issue is Please have the government. But let, let, let me stress a little bit on the, this, yeah. the duopoly thing. So you, you have, um, you know, in California, which is very much of a democratic leaning state, the second best office in the legislature goes to the minority leader um, who has, you know, in some ways, no power. And in Alabama, same thing, might be a very Republican leaning state. The second nicest office goes to the minority leader there. Um, and there's this kind of like 
you know, even in, even in committees, it's like, you've got the, the, you've got the committee chair who goes first, and then you've got the ranking member, um, who's another party who, who may have no power at all. They go second. And it's, it's somewhat nice because it's deferential, but it's also, it also like somewhat entrenchment as well. Like, do you see that as a good thing that we do that? Well, again, th there's been a lot of change in who runs state government sure. over the last 20, 30, 40 years. And with federalism, you've got 50 states, and I want some states to, to run off the road and become examples of what not to do. No one's life is a complete failure. Some people serve as bad examples. California serves as a bad example, um, and it's expensive. But if you try and stop that, then what about the states that are very serious about moving in a different direction that might be more productive? I like the idea of 50 states being able to um, do very radically different things. And then people looking and going, that worked, that didn't work. Uh, and people tend to move states towards the states that are working, that are doing better. It, it takes longer than I'd like, but if you, to do it quickly, you'd be making bad judgments. But uh, when I said there, the two parties, right? There's a leave us alone party that wants the government to be smaller, less intrusive on things. And then there's a party, a takings coalition, the modern democratic party. And that, the reason why I, I talk about too, once you've got the people around the Democrat table, labor union, uh, leaders, uh, big city political machines, the two wings of the dependency movement, people who are locked into welfare dependency and people make $120,000 a year managing the dependency of others, making sure they don't get jobs and become Republicans. All of the coercive utopians who tell you how to run your life because they're better than you are. Uh, and they des design the light bulbs that convince you you have glaucoma uh, and the toilets that don't flush completely. Um, so around the left's table, there are a bunch of people, groups, who teachers unions, who want something from the government at somebody else's expense. And those two coalitions are very, very different and they're going in different directions and they give you a real choice of what you wanna do. Pick one. We, the, um, you, the, recently the US is, the, the voter turnout in the US has been going up 2020. We've seen uh, a lot, very high voter turnout. Do you think, a, do you think this is an anomaly or do you, do you think this is more the norm? And do you think it's a good thing that more voters are turning out now? Or how do you think about just generally on voter turnout? It's often a day, it's often a sign of problems when everybody turns out. Some countries in the third world, everybody turns out because if your team loses, you might get shot. Yeah. Um, so that's not necessarily a healthy thing. I mean, it's it's healthy that everybody wants to- Because it could be high partisanship and just people are more worried about the future. And if you were just like- happy either way, then you probably don't even care to vote or something. But if you're driven by fear of what the government might do to you, if it gets yeah. in somebody else's hand, that's not a healthy sign. But I would argue you're going to see voter turnout up and political participation up because the two parties are so evenly balanced. I mean, take a look. It, this has been a while. If, and this has been true since 94-ish, right? Yeah. The, 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 so before that, the, it just, there were, you know, it was one side or the other. And then- and Oh, then, no, no. There was only one side. Okay, one side. Yeah, yeah, yeah. At least, yeah. At least outside the presidential elections, at least. Yeah. yeah. You look at Congress yeah. from 1932, when Franklin Delano Roosevelt was elected, 32, to 94, 62 years. The Republicans held the House and the Senate. They held Congress four of 62 years. The PRI in Mexico didn't have that level of one party control. Yeah. Uh, presidents get to veto things and can start wars. Congress runs the country. Congress runs the country. We had a one party state nationally, not at the state level necessarily, but in Washington, DC. Since 94, which happens to be the year that 95% of all the Republicans signed the taxpayer protection pledge that we share with people, and the Republican Party became the party that would never raise your taxes. The Republicans have won the Congress 60% of the time, House and Senate, 60%, not one out of 15 years, more than a majority. So the two parties are competitive at the national level. They were not for 62 and years. Not only, they, it's, it's interesting, so in some cases, like in 94, you see these like big, big swings where Republicans may have like, you know, 30, 50 seat, you know, sometimes advantages in the house and stuff. 
Uh, now, even when a party wins uh, uh, one of the chambers, they're winning in a very, very narrow majority. You know, it's like the, the current Senate is 50-50, you know, that you have to have the vice president break the tie. Um, and, um, you know, the, even, even the house, the, the, uh, we're, we're taping this October, 2020, 2022. So who knows what will happen later, but even in the house, uh, the Democrats have a very, very slight majority today. So even, even when you see things flip, they're still super close and it's still kind of in the razors. That just, just, that's just the state of the country right now is that everyone is just like, so it's competitive. Fairly evenly them. balanced. Okay. Uh, and each party senses with some reason that if the other team had control for a few years in a row, they could change all the rules and we would never get off the floor. Okay. Had the Democrats gotten rid of the filibuster and been able to change labor law as they wanted to, to end right to work, to force, to say, you can be forced to join a labor union to work in the United States. Uh, we might've gone back towards right now we're 7% of the private sector is unionized. Could have gone up to towards the 33 percent it used to have because you could force people to join the union in a way that you cannot today um that would change the rules rather dramatically the left fears that much of the left's progress over the last 50 years came from the courts saying we've decided to rewrite the constitution by imagining x and so they've been even though they would lose elections they were driving the country to the left on because the underlying playing field shifted under the feet of elected officials. That's now being undone. Uh, and the idea that Congress can pass a law that says the EPA go do stuff and that that's constitutional to, to hand congressional legislative power to some third to a bureaucrat, okay? The, the courts are going, that's not in the constitution. This is made up. <laughs> this is not a real thing. Um, stop it, okay? If you want to say, Fred, go do something, you better be very specific about what Fred does, because Fred cannot be making decisions that are legislative decisions if he's in the bureaucracy. Um, so there's that shift itself is a dramatic undermining of the whole idea of a progressive bureaucratized government that gets to run everything in your life, like your shower heads uh, and your light bulbs. Uh, the, the left's structure doesn't work if actually Congress or state legislatures have to vote things as opposed to hand the power over to OSHA or the EPA or an unelected bureaucracy, uh, which is all of this dystopian novels have that power handed over to bureaucrats. Now, you mentioned the, the filibuster. To me, the way, if, the way I would think about it, like if I was just not thinking about either party, is if I expect to, to be more likely in the minority in the future, I would want the filibuster. If I expect to be more likely in the majority in the future, I would not want the filibuster. Um, and the way the states are made up in the US, because there's two senators per state, it would be just, if you're just rolling dice 10 years in the future, you're just expecting the Republicans to be more likely to be in the majority than not, because more, more states are controlled Republican yeah you know, in some of the more populous states might be Democrat, but more states are controlled Republican. So you would think the Republicans should be the ones saying we don't want the filibuster and Democrats should be the ones saying we want the filibuster, but it's the opposite. Why is that the case? Um, well, because the Republicans early on said, look, th 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 there was a movement during the Bush years to get rid of the filibuster so that Republicans with, you know, 51, 52, 54 Senate seats could, along with the House, change laws willy-nilly. Yep. Uh, the Democrat, the, the Democrats started to use the filibuster a lot more when the Republicans won the House and Senate. The filibuster wasn't used against court, you know, people running for. It wasn't even used against Bork. Okay, using it against judges is a recent phenomenon. Yeah. Um, and a sign that the Democrats saw the power slipping from their hands, so they everything and anything to slow down. The Republican majorities that they'd never had to deal with before. They'd never had to deal with. You had a Republican government president, but not a House and Senate to go with yeah. him. Um, well, and, even, but in the '80s, just to be fair, like majority of the '80s, the Republicans had the Senate. Um, it, you know, it only flipped in '86, so the, six. starting in '87, right? Yeah, but that was one. That was one body, not yeah. both. Yeah, okay. but at least for like for the for the filibuster, like 
you know, from they already they already had a decade where more than half of it was was Republican. They were kind of, I mean, people were already used to that going in, I presume. Of the 50 states, 30 of them have Republican House and Senate in their state legislature. Yeah. Those 30 states want to be Republican states. And they're, you know, and the Democrats have the other uh, states where the, the legislatures run by Democrats, House and Senate. Um, those states want to be Democratic states. Now, sometimes you can elect a Republican governor in Massachusetts and a Democratic governor right. in Kansas. And same thing with senator state. too, right? The same, yeah. same with the senator, right? And, but over time, there should be 60 Republican senators and, and 40 Democrat senators, right. which is why the D's, the R's could live without getting rid of the filibuster at some point. The D's can't. Well, OK, but it's still it's probably unlikely that the R's will ever have 60, but it's, it seems very likely that there's a, that they'll have 54. Right. Uh, and I mean, so so if I was a D, if I'm on the D team, I would I would be really wanting to preserve the filibuster forever because I would be really worried that um, once it becomes more common that like the R's have it like year after year, um, if that trend kind of continues, that I would I would have no power. Just like in the House, if you're a minority, you have very little power. You'd start, you start you could see a scenario in the Senate where you'd have no power. So it does. It seems to me a little bit short sighted if I'm a D to be saying, oh, let's let's kick out the filibuster. Yeah, I get some things done like this year. Uh, but then all of a sudden, like it, 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 it seems very short term focused. Or am I not understanding the game theory? No, I, I, you're correct, except you're the, the Democrats who are making these decisions are in their 70s and 80s. Uh, uh, so they, they just like they only have one more. They have only a few more years to, to get this thing done. It's not the 40 year old Democrats who are who are making these decisions. And there's a second part to that. Biden finds a Republican Party in the House and the Senate that can say no to be anti-democratic, to be violating a norm, because all the time he grew up, the Democrats had the House and the Senate, or at least the House, uh, if not both, during the time when he was ahead. So most Democrats like Nancy Pelosi only have a recent history of Republicans playing at the congressional level. So they're quite used to the idea that we'll keep a simple majority and we'll just keep running things because they want to they want to change the law to go back to what labor law used to be. You know, they would give them something with more labor union membership, more mandatory labor union membership. You could change a few laws and for quite some time lock in healthy Democratic majorities, maybe not 60 percent, but Democratic majorities. And then you could govern as you used to, say, people who are 75 years old, because that's what they remember being able to do. Interesting. Uh, and I know you're obviously you play for the R team and not the D team. But if you played for the D team, if you if you kind of switch your hat on for a second, like, do you is, is, are there things you think they should be doing differently? Let's say they want to get they still want to get their policies done in the way they want to get it done. Like, do you think they're making like strategic errors? Well, it's tough to tell, but it seems as though by running a series of issues, they're pushing away the Hispanic vote uh, that they had right. thought. The so Republicans that does seem like that's moving very, very quickly are, and it has more historically, except for maybe the 2000 election has been more historically D. Yeah. And so the, they were counting on the Republican discussion of immigration, or at least the Democrats' um, explanation of what the Republicans are really saying when they talk about limiting immigration as something that would scare away all Hispanics. It, Hispanics' views on immigration are not that different than everybody else's. A lot of Hispanics have been in this country for a long time. Yeah. Uh, they didn't all arrive yesterday. I mean, the Democrats have an idea that all Hispanics just came across the finish line, across the border last week. Um, and of course, three generations and any immigrant group reverts to the mean. So you can have somebody come in with, with various political views, but over time, they, they, they vote a lot more like everybody uh, else uh, in the country. Uh, the Catholic vote in the United States was very democratic uh, and now it trends 50-50. And if you look at people who go to church on a regular basis, the half of Catholics who are regular church, church they look like the Christian coalition, um, yeah. uh, Protestants. So th there's when you when you get into this thing about all fill in the blank, ethnic group, relate, racial group, whatever, there's not a lot of that. 
um, or there's a lot less of that than people tend to think. And so if you're counting on all X is going to vote one way, there's uh, the black vote is made up of many, many different people and people who just showed up from Africa or just from the Caribbean are completely different than other African Americans. So um, and the same thing with Hispanic, Cubans, Puerto Ricans, Mexicans, you know, um, the left in trying to play identity politics has tried to make it easy. To, there are only four. <laughs> yeah. And, and they've missed. I mean, that's Africa doesn't look all the same. Uh, and, so, and one of the reasons that Biden won in in in, two, in 2020 is is he he really he really increased his he, he did he did much worse with with Hispanics but he did much better with the white vote um yeah. and so it's like a very interesting kind of um so he really spent it, it seems like spent a lot of capital um doing better there yeah it, it i think it's it, the the american playing field is very very interesting um again in the 50 states um 30 of them have Republican legislatures, both bodies, House and Senate. 23 of them have a Republican governor to go with that. So in those states, if the Republicans get together, they can do anything they want. They can pass any bill they want. And the Democrats have a number of states where they have the Democratic governor in both houses. You're looking at you know, the, the, um, California and the West Coast states and New York and New Jersey, Connecticut, Massachusetts um, states. So you've got some very blue states. So the Democrats can say, look what we're doing here. And they can, here's the advantage I think Republicans have. You're talking about R's and D's. Republican proposals tend to work. Democrat proposals, less so. So when the Democrats passed one uh, single payer system in Vermont, they had to repeal it, get down work. When the Democrats in Massachusetts, when Dukakis, president, uh, presidential candidate Dukakis was running in um, 88, they passed basically uh, Clinton care or Obamacare, right? The mandate uh, in Massachusetts in order for Dukakis to say, we've done government run healthcare in Massachusetts. Well, it never took effect. As soon as you lost the election, they repealed it because it would have crushed Massachusetts' ability to compete in the world. Yeah, they finally they, did uh, Romney care many years later. Yeah. And yes, yes. And, and that was fascinating that Romney made that mistake, cost him the presidency as well. Romney was the one guy who basically took the, the workings of Obamacare, passed it at the state level with, uh, to, to be fair to him, avoiding many of the things that the Democrats wanted to do. But of course, when you leave as governor and you put the structure and the D's will do exactly what they want with your structure and change it. Um, and of course he couldn't run against Obama, against Obamacare, which was unpopular at the time because he'd done the same thing. So he really destroyed his own presidential campaign because he did that as governor. But my point was, good, bad ideas don't go from state to state. Good ideas do. Uh, term limits, state to state. Welfare reform, state to state. Uh, uh, transparency, uh, all government books, state to state. Uh, right to try. If you have a terminal disease and there's a medicine that ha that's safe, but it hasn't been proved effective yet, and it's five years away from being approved by the FDA, you can have it if you or your child is dying, okay? 45 states passed that. Uh, conceal carry uh, to allow people to carry a gun concealed for self-protection. 45 states passed that law before the Supreme Court said that's a universal right. It's not just a state law. But, but the reason why it passed is every state that passed it saw its crime, violent crime levels go down. And all of the things people worried about didn't happen. So you didn't have to have an argument about what's going to happen. You say, well, look at Florida. Florida, 2 million people with concealed carry permits. Um, fewer murders, rapes, crimes, all the things, the violent crimes. So the great thing about federalism is you can try something. We're going to see what happens with school choice. Uh, same thing happened with homeschooling, which back in the 18, 19, 18, 1986, not that long ago, 1986, it was a go to jail crime to homeschool in 48 states. 48 states, go to jail because you weren't sending your child into the public school system. Only two states allowed homeschooling. Now all 50 states allow homeschooling and they win all the spelling bees. So because you can try an idea in one state and things that scared people, you know, oh no, that wouldn't work. And, but it does work. Legalization of marijuana will go state by state unless people look at it and go, oh my goodness, Colorado's falling apart, back off, don't keep going. Um, Truly stupid ideas can only be passed nationally in Washington. Good ideas can be passed state by state. 
What, what, you mentioned healthcare. Healthcare. I mean, I, I know we 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 don't like this idea, or it's, the, the R's, the R team doesn't like the idea of like the 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 national healthcare. Um, but you can't really say you can't like look objectively at our current healthcare system and say like this is great. Um, it's like over twenty percent of our GDP, which is way more than you know, like the the UK spends or something like that, and they have kind of comparable healthcare. Um, it's it's kind of a mess. It's really hard to navigate. If you're not super rich, it's very very hard to like do anything. You still have the weights. You still have to go see like six things before you go see anybody. Like there's still all these problems in our system, even though it isn't quote unquote nationalized. Like. Is there some sort of like better way of saying, okay, we, you know, I, I know it's kind of maybe the worst of all worlds right now, because it's like somewhat national and somewhat competitive. And well, how, how would you go in there and, and change it up? Well, I think if you, what we have right now is a system that's mostly got government funded and government run. Yeah. Uh, and whenever the government funds something, it becomes very expensive, whether that's public education or high or college education or healthcare. So whenever the government gets into the business of trying to make something affordable, it subsidizes it and the subsidies go to the point where it becomes very expensive. The American healthcare is more expensive than European healthcare. Now, I'm not crazy about the idea of keeping the cost down by rationing, which is yeah. you get in the other countries, you get to a certain age, you don't get certain operations. Uh, you can get certain operations in Canada, but you gotta wait a long time and you may not live, uh, which is why people come from Canada to the United States for healthcare and never the other way around. Yep. Um, so uh, I just think you just step by step, take a look at where the government's intervened and see if you can pull it out. I mean, do we really need the number? Does, does the FDA need to take as much time as it does to get a new drug to market? Once you said it's safe, why would you not let doctors and patients decide how effective it is? But the effective question, um, because it's not the same answer for everybody. For some people, a new drug is very effective and for some it's not. So you get a test that tells you it's only effective for some people. So, so it's illegal. Why in the world not start with, is it safe? And if it's safe, then let doctors, patients, hospitals try different things. Uh, right to try, which is passed in 45 states and then passed nationally, that you have the right to try a new drug that's safe if you, if you or a child is dying of something that you can't wait five years to get the drug. There's another one, right to know. Doctors often do, uh, they prescribe things off the uh, off label, yep. okay? And that's legal, but it's not legal for them to tell anybody about it. You, you, so only very slowly do doctors learn about new things that can save lives. So instead of being able to give a speech or run it or, or do an app, let me tell you, I've been using this drug, but it also works for this. And here's the 500 people I've done it with. And yeah. you know, that's illegal. Let's go to jail illegal to tell the truth about the efficacy of an off-label use of a drug. Why does that make any sense? So th there are an awful lot of things that when the government tries to run something and they just keep cobbling stuff together, in addition to making everything more expensive. Um, and of course, much of now hospitals are unionized because they're run by the government and that makes them more expensive and more lethargic and slower to move. Uh, and then you have the trial lawyers who come in to make everything more expensive yet. Yeah, tort reform would also reduce some of our costs uh, on healthcare in a way that other no other countries put up with that level of increasing the cost of healthcare by making everything something you could be sued over. Now, I know taxation is kind of the central issue in in your career, um, and, but but in some ways, like tax taxing is somewhat like of a personal choice. When I lived in San Francisco, like for me, moving um, for taxes would have been a very very big deal. I'd have to move all the way to Nevada, it's like many many hour drive away to go do that. You 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 live in D.C. You could move like two or three miles over the bridge or something like that to Virginia where I live and massively reduce your taxes. Like, so some people are still, even when it's so close, people still choose to live in an area to pay more taxes. Like, is that a good thing? Is it a good thing to like, that we have all this competition? If you think of like DC, Maryland, Virginia, or if you live like you know, uh, in like the Philadelphia suburbs, you could be one or side or the other and you pay a difference of like 7%. Like, is that good for us to see all those things? Or how do you think about the the, the state taxes? 
Well, your question of why do I live in D.C.? If you're trying to be part of the French resistance, you have to be in Paris. OK, <laughs> it might be more comfortable to do it in London, but, but if you want to do make a difference. You need to be in Paris uh, and I need to be in D.C. Uh, and, and I mean, literally in D.C., just all the hours of the day of, of travel and everything else. That we yeah. Make. So it's just uh, like I, I, I'll, I'll put up with the extra four points of taxes because like I feel like I can make a much more of a difference here or something like that. Yeah. So that's why I'm stuck here. Yeah. And, and other people are stuck in various states for different reasons. But you don't need everybody to move away from high tax states in order to convince the high tax states or the District of Columbia that it's probably a good idea to not keep going up and perhaps even to come down. One of the projects of Americans for Tax Reform that I think is going to be one of our most important legacies is 50 by 50, which is our goal is to get 50 states with no state income tax by 2050. Uh, right now, eight states have no income tax, no personal income tax. They may have corporate income tax, but no personal income tax. There are another- It includes states. cap gains too, so both yes. income and cap gains. Okay, yeah. Right. Um, for instance, in uh, uh, the cap gains, dividends, interest. Yeah. New Hampshire has no tax on wages, but does tax dividends and interest. Four years from now, that phases away. We worked very hard to get New Hampshire to phase that out over five years. We're now one year into that. So four years from now, New Hampshire will be a true no-income tax state. Ten years ago, Tennessee taxed dividends and interest and ran around calling themselves a no-income tax state. We said, nonsense, <laughs> you're a fake no-income tax state. And we actually were able to work with the legislature and the governor. And that phased down to where a few years ago, there is there at zero. So and there it's one of the interesting Tennessee's interesting. There's a huge immigration from both California and New Jersey and other places to places like Nashville right now. And uh there's there's a lot of reasons. Uh, there's a Nashville's a great city and the cost of living is lower, et cetera. But but I think part of the reason is that the picking Nashville over some other places is yeah. is is the income tax. So there are another 10 states that are now about to go to zero. Kentucky has voted a 10-year phase down to zero. Uh, North Carolina has been phasing down for 12 years. They'll have no corporate income tax in four years. That's law of the land. And they'll be down to zero on personal income taxes within a, within a decade, North Carolina. Um, and our friends in um, Iowa have taken their top rate, 8.6%. Four years from now, it'll be 3.9%. And then they're committed to go to zero from there. Arizona went from four down to two and a half. Uh, January will be at two and a half. And then they'll phase down to zero from there. Uh, both Oklahoma and Virginia, the governors and the, uh, have said, look, we're going to go to zero. Arkansas, both the legislative leadership and the incoming governor have committed to go to zero as well. So there are about 10 states that are en route to zero uh, which will get you to 18 um, uh, states at zero. But then add to that the ones that are about to come. Oh, Louisiana's got a 15-year phase down uh, to zero, um, which which is already passed into law. And, and, but, and you mentioned all these phase downs. Are, they do these phase downs because it's just too drastic to go from like 6% to zero like the next day. It's like, okay, it just makes much more sense. Over 10 years, we're going to do it. Yeah, there, th that's a very good point. There, there are two ways that people try to get rid of their income tax. One is to take the income tax and drop it on top of the sales tax. Yeah. Um, this fails always, always, always. And the most frustrating thing we've had to do is in every state we've worked, explain to the people who want to take most of the income tax and hand it to sales tax. First of all, you're not limiting the size of government or the expense of government if you just move it to the sales tax. Is it less destructive of growth? Yes, it is somewhat less destructive of growth, but it's still a big chunk of the economy. So what you want to do instead is what North Carolina did best. They said, as revenue hits this point, this new number, then we will cut the personal income tax half a point. And then you come back and say, when revenue now hits this new number, we'll take it down another half a point. Uh, got it. Okay, so they're basically down. saying like, revenue is going to go up over time anyway, because uh, our incomes are going up, more people are moving in, et cetera. So as the revenues as the revenue hits certain plateaus, um, then it's like, well, no reason to have the it's no reason to have more revenue for the state. It's already doing well. In fact, it's already doing better than it did five years ago. So then we can start reducing. It's kind of like if you're a company, it's like, hey, let's start reducing our prices or something like that at this point. Make the make it better for our consumers. 
Yeah, it, it, basically revenue is always coming in, particularly when you have graduate income tax, revenue is coming in faster than, uh, than you need to do the same things you were doing. Uh, if you allow that money to come in, the teachers union will find a way to spend it. Uh, and then the congressmen and state legislators will find a way to give it to their friends. So it's basically a spending cap. And whenever it comes above the spending cap, it takes down um, taxes. Uh, West Virginia is looking to do a phase down over the next two years. Our friends in North Dakota are going from their two and a half top rate to one and a half single rate tax. So between a state with graduate income tax and going to zero, there's a second stage that people ge states generally hit, and that's go to a single rate or flat rate tax. Yeah. So uh, instead of a graduate, Iowa, so it's just simpler. It's simpler. And once you're at a single rate, before I moved to the United States, I used to live in Massachusetts. And in Massachusetts, they have a single rate 5% constitutional requirement. Yeah. Nine states have a single rate tax, including Illinois, which is why their income tax is about 5% instead of 10. Uh, or Illinois, which uh, sorry, uh, uh, Pennsylvania, where it's under four instead yeah. of a 10. Um, so a single rate tax, difficult to raise because whenever you have an idea to spend other people's money, you have to look everybody in the state in the eye and say, you're all paying for this. <laughs> and then we're all listening. Yeah. Oh, it wasn't that good an idea. And so the reason why Massachusetts is not as crazy as some other blue states is they have a single rate tax and it limits how. Yeah, because it's funny because back in the day, people called it tax Massachusetts and stuff yeah. like that. But it's 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 probably the lowest of all the states up there. If you could say, if you look at New York or or New Jersey or now even Connecticut, which used to be a low tax state and stuff like that, like lower than Connecticut, lower yeah. than Rhode Island, lower than Maine, lower than uh, Vermont, not lower than uh, New, New Hampshire. Yeah. They're, they're at zero. But everybody else in the region, because they have the single rate tax. So our goal is to get everybody to the single rate or as many as possible to the single rate tax and then just start the march down to zero. And I think eventually California and New York will have to stop the increases, which they've largely done over the last few years, and then begin to ratchet them down because you cannot have 12 states nearby all either at zero or approaching zero. Um, I think by 2050, if everyone isn't at zero, they will have announced they're on way to zero. And what, um, how do you think of um, uh, you? Um, I, I know that you have this famous quote from like 20 years ago. I, I think it's just like, I started out as a right winger, but when I retire, I want to be a squishy middle of the roader. Like, where do you think, you know, 20 years have gone? Where, where, where are you at now? Are you like, Maybe not yet a squishy middle of the roader, but you're getting closer to it. Or where do you where do you think we are on, on that? I'm a on lot that arc? closer to squishy middle of the roader than I used to be. Uh, for instance, homeschooling, legal in 50 states when I was growing up and a young political person, illegal in most yep. states, in 48 states. Um, the whole idea of school choice, where in Arizona they just passed a law that all state funding is about $6,500 will go to each child. And a parent can say, I'll homeschool, give me the $6,500, or I'm gonna to go to my local parochial school and take my $6,500 and maybe plus it up if I have to. Um, and this is the state's funding and there's also local funding, yeah. uh, which could also uh, be available to uh, parents. Uh, West Virginia's passed one that's just about available to everybody as has New Hampshire. This is now the coming new normal and I think it'll drive more people moving across state lines than the income tax. Uh, because you're talking about, you know, we're, we're spending $15,000 per child when both, the, when the federal, the state and the local all follows the child, which is what will flow first, the state's gonna follow the child and then local and then federal. Um, you're talking, that's, that's more money than many people pay, much, many people pay in taxes, particularly if you have a number of children. So moving to a state that gives you more access to go to the kind of school you want to or decide to homeschool. If you have three kids and mom or dad wants to stay home and, and teach them, you've almost got a paycheck there yeah. in, in, the, in the school choice flowing with you. And to give you some sense of 
how big a shift that is because it seems kind of normal now. In 1983, I was in Baltimore with Newt Gingrich and 35 Republican congressmen who thought the great, a great idea, way to spend the weekend was to sit around and think out gold standard, flat tax, this, that, you know, what, what should we do? You know, not what we can do now, but what, where ought we to go? And somebody said at our table of seven, we were thinking school choice vouchers and a very prominent conservative, you know his name, um, meetings were off the record, so I'll <laughs> not mention it because I'm sure he doesn't want to remember this. He stood up and said, if you're going to discuss vouchers, which is what we called school choice back then, I'm going to have to leave the room. Not, not I want to be on record, I'm not for that. Right. I can't be in a room where someone else talked about this. Because it was just scary. such a hot button issue back then. Uh, Interesting. Contribution uh, pensions instead of defined benefit pensions. The entire public private sector has moved over. The federal government's moving over state by state. Utah's completely switched over. Everybody, you know, here's your 10% of your paycheck. You can match it. That's your retirement in a defined contribution 401k structure. When we get that to all 50 states, we end the unfunded liabilities, which are now in the trillions. Um, but state by state, as that gets fixed, that's a dramatic change. And it means every citizen will have wealth as opposed to a promise from Social Security right to a check from time to time, but actually have wealth that can go to the next generation. Um, so that, it, I, those are the, and then the, 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 um, the support which the Second Amendment has had, not just from the courts, but more importantly from voters where 45 states voted to say, in our state, if you're 21 and you're not crazy, you're not a criminal, you can go, you can have a gun and carry it concealed. 25 states don't even require a license now. Uh, and those are the states with less violence, less, less murder, rape, and assault. They'll still steal your car when you're not there, but they won't, they're much less likely to grab you and a, a bad person or to break into your house when you're home. So those are very dramatic swings in terms of both public opinion and where we are uh, legislatively. So I, I think going to define contribution pensions, which the private sector did, right? The next big shift is gonna be independent contractors. Uh, and when that happens, the world changes. Right now, there are about 13 million people are independent contractors, Uber drivers, Lyft drivers, the truckers were all on, you know, uh, blocking the, the port in Los Angeles because they've been made illegal by the Democrats in California made independent contractors illegal, um, except for Lyft. <laughs> um, but but for trucks, if somebody bought his own truck, now it's not legal for them to be an independent contractor and they have to move to another state uh, to continue to be a driver. The goal will be state by state and then nationally to say, if you wanna be an independent contractor, here's what you do. You write a letter to the IRS and say, give me my independent contractor number. I'm an independent contractor. And then all labor law in America becomes voluntary. Because, what? yep. One of the things that um, you know, there's there's the critique of the R team is that uh, when they get in power, it, at least at the national level, um, they tend to mass they they tend to massively increase government spending. Maybe not as much as the D team. If the D team happened to be in power the same year, maybe the D team would increase it. Uh, a 13% instead of 11% or something, but it still goes up dramatically under any team that, 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 that's out there. And it, it's somewhat of a hypocritical thing sometimes when you, when you hear the R's talk about, uh, how do you respond to that? Sure, you're half right and half missing something. Okay. The half, the half right is look at the federal government. Most of the federal government's on automatic pilot. So the Republicans get elected, you've still got Medicare, Medicaid, food stamps, all the entitlements on automatic pilot, unless you've got 60 votes in the Senate. But we did increase, I mean, even in the last few years, I mean, we had these massive uh, um, um, stimulants that went into the economy. Um, and some of that was under uh, 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 George W. Bush, so yeah. some a lot of that was under President Trump. So you, you, it wasn't just Obama-Biden time for the increases. Uh, no, 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 but I'm saying that-, yeah. that I know it might increase that anyway. Yeah. There are differences between how much an R and a D will will spend. And Reagan did some serious 
spending restraint, even with the Defense Department getting larger. Um, and Reagan, remember, took the Defense Department up to six and then down to four and three when we won the Cold War. Yeah. One of the few government programs where we won the Cold War, now we're cutting spending dramatically, which was a good idea. I know the, my friends in the Pentagon <laughs> panicked, but um, you should spend less when the Soviet Union doesn't exist anymore. Um, and, and Russia's annoying, but it's not the Soviet Union. Um, but so it's harder to see the difference in an R and a D at the federal level because so much is on automatic pilot. But the R's tend not to invent whole new spending programs which is what the D's have 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 done. New and by the way, just to, just to focus on the R's have still invented a lot of new spending programs. I mean, the the, uh, the Bush had a prescription drug program. There was a whole bunch of like all, you know all these new things that came for COVID under Trump. I mean, there there are a lot of other. Uh, there's a, it, maybe they, maybe they do less than the D's. I, I, you know, but it's not but like it's they don't do any. Hard to see the difference. Yeah. But yeah. What I'm saying is, it's hard to see the difference when so much of it's entitlement spending. Yeah, okay. Now, here's the part that I, I think you weren't, the people don't see, 50 states, New York, 20 million people, Florida, 22 million people, more people in Florida than in New York, okay? Florida, 200 billion, uh, I'm sorry, Florida, uh, uh, New York state budget, 200 billion. Florida state budget, 100 billion. Florida spends half per capita what New York spends, okay? And that is the difference. And if you yep. compare red states and blue, now, to be fair, some states became red in the last 10 years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. West Virginia, Arkansas, you cannot make me responsible for those mm -hmm. states. They only recently became Republican states. I get a kick out of people who go, well, look at Mississippi is very poor. And now it's a Republican state. It must be because it's Republican. Actually, it was poor. <laughs> All the time, it was a Democratic state. Yeah. It's getting a little bit better now, but it has a long way to go. But they're getting rid of their income tax. So watch watch that state to, to do well. Um, Ohio, uh, uh, Alabama, maybe and this not. Is, is it like, okay, so let's say you're, you're Florida, you're spending less. I have, a, I have a bunch of friends that move from New York to Florida. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, the first thing you do when you move to a new stage, you go to the DMV. And uh, the, the Florida DMV, at least this is their anecdotal evidence, like the Florida DMV was just way easier and way better than the New York DMV. I'm sure their budget is way smaller um, than the New York, but it's still better. Like, is it just, is that, at that point, is it just leadership? Is it just, is it just like, which I don't think necessarily RRD are better leaders, but is it just leadership saying, hey, we're going to run this more efficiently or better? Or It's, it's largely the number of, your, of government employees you hire. Okay. Um, and you have Rick Scott, who was governor for eight years before DeSantis. Uh, much of what DeSantis likes to point to are things that Rick Scott did in terms of every year, little tax cuts, but every year he held the, spend, he held the, the number of jobs down. He took the number of uh, jobs down and the pensions are not as crazy. So in New York, many more government workers with much higher pay compared to their private sector uh, competitive people and pensions that are way out of line compared to, to red states. So what you pay for in New York is not better policing, just more people technically in the police force. They may not all wear a uniform, but the numbers of people working and the pensions they get and the pay they get. That's the biggest driver. Uh, and the pensions are the hidden cost because politicians Love, I, I, look, I can't give you a bunch of money today because everybody's watching. Yeah. But I'll give you a pension so that when I'm dead, you're going to retire with all this money and it won't be my fault or I'll be dead. So who cares? Uh, and so that the cost, the debt, the, the cost that California has, New York has on pensions, uh, unfunded liabilities, pensions way beyond what anybody's saving uh, for the future. That's one of the drivers between the states, plus unionization rates. When you build something in Florida, you don't necessarily have to hire union contractors. In New York, you do, and you pay higher wages and higher pensions and longer periods to do the work. So there, you're right. You, the roads in Florida, are everybody's good, maybe better than New York. The schools are everybody's good, maybe better than New York. You don't see it in the services or, you would, or, or people would leave Florida. Yeah, and move to New York, um, but they don't. What uh, you know, I would say, if you most tech workers uh, are, are consider themselves Democrats, 
Uh, and, and certainly if you think of this podcast world of DAS, most of our listeners uh, would probably consider themselves uh, Democrats. Uh, why do you think that is? Uh, why do you think like tech is so heavy in the D side? Because uh, they make enough money they can afford to be. Um, uh, it's not easy to be a middle class person and vote for the Democrats, given the taxes and the structures that they th that they put on top of people. If you make enough money, you can afford uh, a government that's a little bit sloppy uh, and, and more expensive. Uh, but even at the end of the day, um, one of the challenges tech has, it should be much more independent contractor. It should be much easier to move from one job to another. Our immigration, which lets talented people come in, doesn't let them move around then as, as easily as, they, as yep. they ought to be. We should have much more flexibility there uh, on, on labor law. Um, and uh, it, it, it is interesting. I mean, people vote on different issues. Yeah. Um, you may see more people voting on crime in this election than they have been recently because crime hasn't been as bad until recently, it's, um, you have to go back to the 80s to, to, to see some real levels where people were voting on the crime issue yep. and New York was driven by the crime issue. Uh, and now- and Certainly in the 60s, it's, it became a huge issue. This was like yeah. the Nixon issue was crime, right? So. Yeah, and, but it happened again in the 80s. You know, yeah. It got really bad. Um, so I think people vote on the issue that seems to impinge on the most. Uh, if the economy continues to on its present path of inflation and slow or even negative growth, then even tech people might go, this is not working and be more open to vote for a Republican with a slightly more open view of how the economy should be left alone. Now, we recently did a uh, World of Dallas episode with Jim Himes, who's a Democratic congressman, um, and he talked a lot about uh, the, a central bank digital currency, a CBDC, um, and, and he's, he's kind of an advocate for that. I know that American for Tax Reform, your organization, can't, kind of came out opposed to a CBDC. Like, how do you think about that, though, these types of you know, um, innovations in, um, at the Federal Reserve? Well, there are private... Uh, currencies, yeah, uh, or and I think the bill I want in the next tax bill is that all precious metals or strategic metals or strategic stuff that we need from other places should have no capital gains tax on it if you store it in the United States. So if you do cobalt and all the other nickel and things that yep. people need, and you store it here. And all they have to do is promise that if there's an emergency, the government can buy, you will sell it to the government at market prices, not at market prices three weeks ago. Yeah. <laughs> at yeah. Market prices. So you're not getting looted, but, but you're promising to store the stuff here, which helps with the questions of supply chain and all that yeah. sort of stuff. But the other reason I want to do it is because that's how you get commodity backed currencies with large quantities of currency. And why does it have to be stored here to, to have a commodity back? To, it doesn't. Uh, it has currency. to be stored here to make it free of capital gains taxes. Uh, okay. Have it okay. be a commodity back currency. That you can't have a capital gains tax on gold and then have gold be a currency because every time you buy and sell it, it you know, um, yeah, yeah. you have to pay tax on the, the gold. And so a commodity back currency, which might be backed by 20 or 30 different commodities, as long as they were not having a capital gains tax on them as they moved around, you could back currencies and you could have private sector currency completely backed with real goods, real goods that are you know, here and that yeah. people feel comfortable with. Um, I don't want the government getting into the business of setting up competing currencies with the dollar or the ruble or anything else. I would rather have the government getting out of the business of running currencies. Now, run the dollar, you know, what we're doing right now, but don't give them anything else to do. Uh, until for, These are the guys who inflated the dollar. They, 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 they want to be in charge of the next new thing? No, no. Well, it, you, one of the things that uh, you are so well known for is just having a very long view. Uh, it seems like min, many people in politics, it's like the, it's not even they have a two year cycle. It's like they have like a two day cycle. Um, and you, you have this famous quote, like there's nothing you can do about tomorrow. Essentially, there's really nothing you can do about next week. But if you've got a 25 year uh, horizon, you know, there's really no limit. To, to what you can do. It's kind of like a Warren Buffett view of politics. Like he's got the very long view. There's a lot of investors, some of which make a lot of money who are trading every day. 
um, he's making very, very long-term decisions. Like, is it something in your personality that does that? Or how, why do you think like that, that that's essentially your advantage is time, right? Yeah. Well, when I, I got involved in politics uh, early on, uh, and some people think it's funny. I, I think it's- Well, you've been, you've, been, you've been a well-known activist for 40 yeah. years now. Yeah. Um, when I was about 13 or 14, I was riding home on the bus from Weston Public High School, uh, and the teacher had been berating us. Democracy doesn't work. No one knows who's the state legislature. They're voting for people they don't know. It's all stupid. It's all nothing. And I thought, well, that's not completely wrong. I don't know who the state led, you know, the state rep is. Um, and that takes a lot of time and effort to advertise that. I said, what if the modern Republican Party was the party that would never raise your taxes? That was the one brand they had, okay? You might be able to add to it, but I thought you could credibly police no raising taxes and then go to the people in the town, a city, a school board nationally and say, we're not gonna raise taxes. We're gonna reform government to deal with what we need to do with, but we're not raising taxes. That's the one thing we won't do, okay? Since the Republican party did that at the national level in 94, they became competitive at the federal level. Now, nobody was listening to me when I was 13 and 14 years old. Um, so I was, um, uh, I was 30 when I was able to get people to start taking the pledge. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, 10 years later, we had all the Republicans 95% of all the Republicans take the pledge and nobody's broken at the national level. We're now bringing it to the state level, to cities, to counties, to school boards. Uh, so it's gonna go down further. But right now we're, most, most Republican governors have signed the pledge um, and we're getting state legislators as well. But the Fed, all the presidential candidates and all the uh, House and Senate, I mean, state legislative, sorry, House, Senate, uh, national, um, take the pledge. And so you've been able to get the Republican party be the party who won't raise taxes. That means you then have to be the party to reform government, pensions, competition, all the things you want to do to make government less expensive and more are required by your commitment not to raise taxes. So it was that length of the view. And the, the other one is the, the whole importance of expanding IRAs and 401k so that everybody in the private sector had life savings. Now, 60% of Americans have their money in a 401k or an IRA. Um, so attacking capital and people's life savings is now a fool's errand. One of the challenges Biden has is that he's very old. He, in his lifetime, remembers when 10% of Americans own shares of stock directly. That's a while ago. That's not, remember we, remember we gave that speech and, you know, it, out in, to, to the field in Pennsylvania? You know, nobody here owns any stock, he says to this group of people who are all in cars because of COVID and stuff. We didn't know. 60% of the people in that audience did own shares of stock directly. But he was talking to them as if they, they got a paycheck and that was it. And they had no life savings. So um, the D's have not yet figured out how to deal with the fact that, we're not, that, that we have a, a middle class with life savings who are capitalists in, in, in the stock market and so on, as well as their home and, and land they might own. But stock market is more portable and more life savings even than a, than a house. And sometimes um, people on the other side of the aisle, even though they might be fighting for very, very different things, can have like a deep admiration for one another, even though they want very, very different things. Like uh, like Pelosi and McConnell kind of admire each other, even though they, 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 they go for different things because they're both just incredibly good operators at what they do. Um, who's the liberal activists that you admire? Um, that's a very good question because every once in a while, I run the center right coalition on the right, and people keep going, "Who's the guy on the left is going to do this?" Uh, <laughs> and it, 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 I've tried to explain briefly, the left coalition doesn't hold together the way the right does. So they, they, you put them around a table, they fight over the money in the middle of the table. They don't work together um, unless there's enough money, then they can work together. Uh, I, I, well, there there are a number of folks on on the left. I guess. Let me start by saying there is a place, you're talking about partisanship. I am very much in favor of left-right coalitions that do not require anybody to sacrifice principle. Bipartisan compromise is how we got the present mess. 
the Republicans and the Democrats would get together and say, I'd like to steal some money and give it to my friends, says the Republicans, but you don't want them to have it. And the Democrats say, well, we want to get together, steal some money for our friends, but you don't want them to have it. How about if we vote to fund all of our friends? Right, right. Let's just all money. steal money. Right, right. Okay. Yeah. okay. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's that, the that, president that's, now. That, that seems like I probably most of the public thinks both sides are crooks. Both sides are doing all this bad stuff. Right. But, but the the more conservative and the more left Democrats who work on principle, we can work together and have on criminal justice reform, uh, civil asset forfeiture, the idea that the police should not be able to stop you and steal the money in your car because, you know, it's money and they just take it as, you know, well, we think it might be drug money. And even if you're never charged with anything, never convicted of anything, go hire a lawyer and try and get your $5,000 back. Okay. The lawyer costs more than that. So fighting against civil asset fortune, the ACLU and Americans for Tax Reform have worked state by state on those issues. Um, how long should some people be in prison? Do you really need uh, mandatory minimums as long as we have in the national level and in some states, right and left, we could work together to get that. That passed under the Trump administration with Van Jones and the NAACP and the ACLU, working with groups like Americans for Tax Reform and other uh, right of center uh, groups who all thought, well, I got a few too many people in prison for a few too many laws, and perhaps we can bring that down a tad. There's a lot more yet to do uh, on that one. Uh, 18 states have legalized knives. Um, back in the 1950s and 60s, there was a mass murder of people in movies and TV shows, uh, West Side Story, people killed with knives, uh, rubble without a cause, people killed. With... So the legislature's banned knives uh, and switchblades and drop knives and so on. And, who gets picked up and have their pockets opened up and you want to plead down from a felony kid, uh, tend to be minority kids. So the NAACP, the National Rifle Association, conservative and left of center groups get together in Texas and New York both. And with 80% support, get legalized, keep a knife, holding a knife in your pocket. Um, and you've, and you've had over the years, I, I know you've personally worked with like Ralph Nader on some things and some ways you would say, okay, wow, you guys are very different types of people. He's very, you know, he's very much on the creature of the left, you're a creature of the right. Um, but I you would, guys have had in some ways that uh, you guys, uh, in some ways have an admiration for one another. You've been able to work with one another on, on, on some things. I was creeping up on the answer to your question. Oh, okay. Yeah. Was, Who do I, and that the answer would be Ralph Nader. Oh, really? I okay. Worked, so that is the I, answer. Okay. Yeah. yeah I worked yeah. with him on, uh, term limits. Because you know he thought if we had more term limits, there'd be more turnover, and yeah. we'd elect more left wingers. I thought if we had more turnover, we'd elect more right of center people. Uh, so we 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 disagree on what we thought would happen, but we both agreed that it's a bad idea for somebody to run for thirty years because they almost have a monopoly, and their name ID becomes very difficult to run against somebody who's got three million dollars worth of name ID and any challenger has to you know do three millions of dollars of advertising yeah. to get their name to where the other guy's name is um uh the uh, other issues uh transparency ralph nader and i both went to the bush administration and said guys you should open up all the books to be completely transparent we went to a lot of states every state except california is fully transparent now uh in terms of their budgets and and how they spend their money um uh, schwarzenegger promised me he was going to do it and he but Anyway, it didn't happen. It still hasn't happened. They remain the closed down, non-transparent state compared to everybody else. Uh, but Ralph Nader's theory was, if people understood how the money was spent, they'd say, Myrtle, look at how wonderfully the government's spending our money. Let's send them more. And I tend to think if they knew how the government was spending the money, they got, uh, not so much. But we don't agree on why you should have, I mean, everyone should have transparency so they can make and educated good decisions. Yeah. decision yeah. on how to vote for people. Well, I also that that's also a good. I mean, you want if you're if you're spending a budget or understanding a budget, you kind of want to know. So that that seems like a good bipartisan issue where everyone can agree is. on something like that. Yeah. Um, and Ralph Nader and I went to the the only press conference I've ever had that nobody attended at all. Nobody uh, was when Ralph Nader and I had one about a week and a half before the '92 election, when I think 14 states passed term limits with an average vote of 70 plus percent of the vote. Uh -huh. Nobody came to the press in DC, no, because the establishment press didn't like term limits. Nobody covered the fact that we were talking about, this is sweeping the country, look at you know, how well it's going to be doing, and here's why. 
Not a single person came. Well, another, he, another he's kind of like you is like, he also has staying power. I mean, he's been around for 50 plus years. He just keeps doing what he's doing. And he, you know, and it, it just, uh, so, so you have to admire somebody like that. And what you want to do in politics or other things, do the things that lead to future victories now. The, um, the more 401ks, the more IRAs, the bigger they are, the more people can put in them, the more people 5, 10, 20, and 30 years from now will care about taxes on capital gains or the death tax or you know any number of things that moves them to the right. There was some great polling data Scott Rasmussen had many years ago, uh, and it basically was that if you have $5,000 worth of stock in the stock market, it makes you 20% more Republican and less Democrat on average, but every demographic group in the country, all white, black, old, young, rich, poor, became more Republican with share ownership. Same thing with government employment. Everybody becomes more Democrat if they if they're work for the government, on, on average, on average. Um, and so the more people are in the stock market, have a 401k IRA, the more Republicans, the more people work for the government, the more Democrats which is why the Republican solution to healthcare is health savings accounts and education is education savings accounts. And the Democrat promise is 50,000 more cops or 50,000 more this or yep. more workers. Um, they have very different interests, but each one is credit moving forward in a way that they think five, 10 and 15 years from now, there'll be more R's or more D's as a result of today's win or loss. All right. Two last questions. One, one is um, more personal questions. One is you're, you're, you, you, you're famously a big proponent and attendee of Burning Man. Mm -hmm. um, okay. And on the one hand, okay. Burning Man is kind of like, it's, it's, it's libertarian and it fights the government to get access to the land. It's got these libertarian ideals. So let, let's set it up. On the other hand, I don't know, at least on brand, it doesn't seem like it's generally a place where you expect like a whole bunch of conservative activists to hang out. Like, why do you like it so much? Uh, I love it because uh, uh, Larry Harvey and Miriam, who brought me to it originally because the government was yeah. looting. And Larry it. Harvey, who passed away, he was the original yeah. founder of Burning yeah. Man, right? Yeah. And um, they asked, they came to work with me on how do we get the government to not take stuff from them. Um, and we had some successes, not complete, but, but some progress. Uh, and they invited me along. And um, uh, so I, I, I've been going, I don't know, for the last 10 years or so. Uh, I go every year. We, we missed two years because of COVID, uh, but just we had it just this year. It's always like the last week in, uh, in August. Yeah. It is a wonderful collection of people who get together, who build a city all voluntarily. There's, there's really very little government, but they map out roads, okay, yeah. so that you can and, and people pick spots that they, they're going to have their tent or their RV or their trailer. Um, uh, but other than that, you pretty much up to do what you want to do. I just find it delightful. I wrote a piece for The Guardian, uh, which would have been um, in 2013, I think, 2013, uh, on my view of it, which is actually the Larry Harvey was kind enough to say it's the best one you know, 700 words the best short summary of burning man um which is quite something because he's written about burning man uh but i liked it because it was trying to explain what i saw and it was asking the question from the guardian said well aren't you this conservative guy why are you out yeah. of the hippies um and in that piece the guardian um uh piece Grover, by grover norquist uh, that's a very good summary, both of what Burning Man is, as approved by Larry Harvey, uh, and my sense of why I like it as a model for structuring things. And, and do you just, get into like because I imagine the vast majority of attendees probably are, are at least consider themselves on the D team. Um, so do you, while you're there, are you just like enjoying interesting conversations with people and stuff like that about politics and stuff? Well, it, it, two things. Um, I present every time I've been uh, at the uh, Psychedelic Drug Associations. Uh, they have a series of speakers come in and so on. And I talk about the politics of liberty uh, yeah. and to that group. And it's like talking to a bunch of college Republicans because um, they're in favor of liberty. Uh, but the, the other piece there is there are a lot more Republicans and libertarians at Burning Man than <laughs> you might think. 
because uh, I, you know, people, are, you know, you and I are the only Republicans here. And yeah, you and the last twenty people I talked to. Uh, <laughs> there's, there's a lot more um, of that. People from all over the world uh, really appreciate the the freedom that's there, and uh, and and Burning Man is art, and it's a lot of hard work. Okay. Yeah. If you watch, it's the, a ton of hard work. Yeah. Yeah. It, 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 it's, it's hard work just to get there. This yeah. Uh, never mind, you know, the artwork that gets put up and and so on. Um, but I, I just find it extremely uh, wonderful. I intend to keep going forever and ever and ever. Um, 